Good morning. I'm up super early. I'm going to do a really cool podcast today with my friend Patch from Wide Sky Guitars out in Taos, New Mexico. Got a bit of a drive and I got to get rolling. So come on. I was hoping to be well on my way at this point, but I'm just getting on the highway now. So I'm about an hour behind schedule. Check out this tree. Oh man, it's cold. <laughs> Getting close. There's some cool murals out here in this little town. Turns out it's the oldest town in Colorado. I just figured I'd walk over here for a second. This is like the center, cultural center of the oldest town in Colorado. Brother, 
Hello, dude. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, made it. You did. It was an easy trip. Good. All right, let's hang out. Okay. Cool, let's do it. Welcome to the Aaron Holstein Vibe Squad podcast. I'm here with my friend Patch Rubin at his guitar shop, Wide Sky Guitars, out in Taos, New Mexico. Thanks for coming down. I had a, a job as a guitar tech in LA, um, working for a place that would uh, rent out amazing guitars to studios. So when people would come in and do session work, they would rent out epic Les Pauls or Strats or different acoustics or and had all the amps to pair with it. And so, you know, I, I was a guitar player, but that's got me really interested in like what the guitar, like how different ones felt differently. And I like different ones I wanted to keep playing and different ones like, you know, didn't want to touch again. Like, why is that the neck or this, or just that got me interested in the guitar as, as a whole. But even then it wasn't something that I was like, oh, I'm going to make these. It was just, I was really interested in, I still wanted to be, you know, just performing and doing that. Were but, you a properly trained t a guitar tech or did you teach yourself that or? I got an apprenticeship from, as this, I was at Musicians Institute and this guy, Andy Brower came and gave a lecture on how to, you know, keep your guitar in shape. Yeah. And I thought that's, yeah, I want to, something sparked in there. And I went to his shop where this is where he had all these guitars I mean, it was I don't even remember, like 40 or 50 of these amazing instruments. And I asked for an apprenticeship and I got one. And then not long after that, I started working full time. I mean, that's kind of how it's, how it started. Then being a musician, you know, you need other work. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, you uh, do. And doing from one thing to another. And then I started getting carpentry work uh -huh. and knew nothing, but started building houses and learning that, that trade. And then as you keep doing that, your skills refine and then you hopefully, or you're, you know, it's hard building houses. So sometimes you want to kind of refine your skills and get trim work or cabinetry work or things like that. And that's, so it, I just kept trying to refine those skills and work in better working environments than job sites. <laughs> <laughs> Is guitar building on the difficult end of the spectrum or where would you put it in terms of all of the woodworking type of stuff you've done? Oh, by far the hardest, like without question. I mean, I knew when I first started my building my first one that it would be hard, but it was, it was so much harder than I thought. Cause a lot of it's going against the rules of cabinetry or something, just like you're bending wood, you're, you're making it as light as possible, but then adding structure in some places and others and not because you want plates to move. And that's important for the instrument to be sounding good just the finish like the finish work there's the high detail in order to get the guitar interesting to like you want it to be something that people can look at and say oh i'd like to pick that up right and then it but, needs to feel good and sound great yeah and it needs, <laughs> and it to, needs to hit all those things and it's all those different marks and it's yeah. if you get one thing wrong in the beginning and you don't pick up on it you could get to almost the end and be like oh my gosh the strings are you know, this far off the, the soundboard and that's, right. that's not going to work. So it's very, um, it's complicated. I've got a heating blanket and metal slats. So I'll take this, what is essentially is what's going to be the side. Yeah. I soak it in water and then I wrapped that side in a paper bag, soak it again. And then I pull that out and then I wrap it in aluminum foil, stick it in between a metal slat and a heating blanket and another metal slat. And I stick it in here and it's still stiff but it's wet and break. And, um, and then the heating blanket starts creating steam, like it heats up and it starts heating the water in the wood. And um, there's something called lignin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's, it relaxes in the wood and that's when you can start bending it. And I do this all by, I have a, a barbecue grill for a thermometer. But yeah. that's, that's just kind of like this rough, but basically I'm doing it all by how it sounds. Like I know like it starts, the water is like, but like it's, I can hear it sizzling at this certain temperature and yeah. I can see steam and I start thinking, okay, now I can start slowly bringing this clamp down and then the sides are doing this. And then I've got this clamp and I can, which connects onto here. And then I can pull the, this, like with, with the spring tension, I can 
then pull the side down. Right. And um, and then I basically heat up, keep heating the wood until all the water is out. And then that's my front side. You're dealing with things that move and like just with humidities and things, or just, it's, there's a lot to it. But you know, you spend hundreds of hours working on this thing and then you start like at any one point you can just totally mess it up. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, or you could it, get to the end and have done everything right. And then it, the result is it doesn't, it didn't end up sounding the way you had imagined or, or something's weird about it. Right. Yeah. And the, you know, you could take all those as learning experiences, but it's really, you know, if you put so much time into something, you it'd be cool if it worked out. The first one I did took me a year. The second one took two years. Um, and now I'm Was at, that just because you were part-timing this and you were, and it was just kind of hobbying or was it because it really took that long to build? It? Well, both. The first one took, certainly took that long because, uh, I was doing it on weekends and nights, um, using my boss's shop. He'd right. go, he'd go away and I could go in there and, and use all his tools. Um, but it also took me like, it took me like a month to figure out how to attach the neck <laughs> to the guitar because I'm learning from YouTubes and, and books. I didn't know anybody to learn that the building skill from. Right. So I've learned it's all kind of been the hard way. So much within the guitar world, people are making their own tools to get the job done, which is part of what I really love. So it's interesting to see how other people are crafting this widget to be able to do this move on the guitar to make this attachment or something. It's not very standardized around the world? Some things are, um, but at the same time, it's like a lot of people are, I mean, if you look around, I've built all my tools. The shop, like how I've dedicated all my workbenches, and I mean, that's all part of my tool and part of my jigging system of how I do this work. I have workstations over there for specific things. This is where I do all my finishing and my setup. Um, and that's where I do all my routing. This is where I do most of the building right here. Um, How many guitars can you make kind of at once and at various stages the way that you're set up right now? For my PL1 guitar, I, I'll prep all the materials uh, for about 10 at a time. Mm -hmm. But then once I start building, I'll build two at a time until I get where it's the time to put a neck on. Okay. And then once that happens, then I focus on one guitar and see that through till it's about ready for finish. And then I'll start the bring the other one and bring that through to finish and then finish them both at the same time and then start over again. And that whole process, kind of getting back to your question is, I can do that in a month. So make two in a month. Okay. As a one man operation, that's kind of like maximum output in, in terms of you being able to carefully, you know, quality control the whole yeah, process. And yeah, because like I say, there's so many times you can just ruin something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And you have know, you? I mean, that sounds like you have uh, I learned, <laughs> learned that the hard way, perhaps. I learned th my, th I think this, I might have learned this one early, like my second guitar, but just like I only carve necks in the kind of the first half of the day. Because if you just do one, stroke too many with your file or whatever, then the neck is too thin. When I'm doing this binding, uh, I run the, this router over the body. I put it in this frame, but, and, um, cause the top has a curve to it and the back especially has a curve to it. The, if you just ran a router on it, the router would be angled and it wouldn't give you a true 90 degree cut. Whereas this keeps it 90 degrees. And I'll run this through in this, it's sitting in this guy, but I'll run it through and it'll give me a 90 degree cut along this whole thing. That's the thing with like the whole guitar making is it's so many like make your tools to make this other thing happen. And that's a lot. I mean, I love making the guitars, but I also love making the tools to make the guitars too. These are all my body shapes, like the molds. I'll have just the side and I'll use these expansion clamps to 
keep the side in the shape and I'll build the instrument in this before I put the top on. This is how I make all my bridges and saddles for the PL1 are just using these two guys. Um, these are layout like for when I glue the bracing onto the back. Or actually this is for the top. I'll put, clamp that down first onto the table and then I can arrange my braces around that and that's the way they're always uniform to where I want them to be. Chisels. Files. Uh, these are a bunch of templates I've had made. I have a friend who in town has a CNC machine and he's made me. I've drawn these out and then he cuts these out. So this is my head plate jig and he also cuts out wide sky and then I fill in with aluminum dust and and that's how I get the wide sky there. But then this will go on the head of the guitar. I'll put this on there and then I'll route out the shape and voila. And I've got that for several different shapes. Also my 12 strings that I do. Um, various little saws, which this is my currently my favorite one. It's tiny, but it's awesome. Uh, when I'm gluing brace or my braces down, this is how I clamp everything down. And it's awesome because how else would you do this? Like you like if you tried to use clamps, it would get ridiculous. But this gives me a really even pressure all the way around. These braces are pre sort of carved now, so they don't there's not as much material for these to sit on, but you kind of get the idea. But this is a really great way it's to clamp all night, to clamp the wood down. There's never enough clamps. I'll use all of these. And then all of these at various times, like you just... <laughs> right. Are you playing a lot of music these days? I play a lot of guitar, which, I mean, makes sense. Right. But, <laughs> uh, but I haven't been, I haven't made anything. I've really kind of, I've enjoyed not feeling like I have to or want that, or if that drive has kind of left me of like, I've got to, you know, keep putting myself out there and see if something will happen. Um, like you're getting which, the satis creative satisfaction out of this that may you may have been looking for in music before you were doing guitars yeah and even more so i mean this is like i'll make something and i finish it and then it goes out to somebody else and then they make music and that is like actually the coolest thing ever right make something somebody gets it and they do their art right which like you're enabling yeah creativity and that i felt awesome when someone said, oh man, you know, I went home and, and started and wrote my first song because I got excited by your, what you were doing or whatever. And I imagine it's even more so when you make an instrument that inspires someone and someone says, man, I made my new album on your. And it's happening and it's the yeah. coolest, like, it, I mean, it, it really can't get better than that for me. So on that level, that's what I find really inspiring. You know, it's a month long process to finish which doesn't for what the work is doesn't seem that that long when I include people with like I'll send photos of like the progress of that so they get to see like the insides of the instrument or the like oh now the neck's on you know now I'm putting the frets on the fretboard or and then I send them the instrument and then get some feedback and it's been pretty good so it's in terms of my like feeding my creative kind of fire or fire or just like fulfillment or something. It's definitely really has all of that. Was it, was it a trip going to, you just went to Nam. Um, yeah. I, I imagine that wasn't exactly the part of it that you were imagining when you started making guitars. Like that's like the business marketing, you know, <laughs> salesmanship side of, of, of the whole picture. What was that like to rep yourself at NAM, which is such completely a... Completely opposite of what I like to do. Uh, it was cool. What I got invited to be a part of was uh, the Boutique Guitar Showcase, which was um, within NAM, a curated show of 31 builders, small builders. And they had an area of kind of in the middle of the main floor of the the show 
for us to set up and show what we're doing. And so I was surrounded by all these amazing builders who were pushing boundaries in different ways. Was and there was, a vibe amongst the guitar builders where you guys were like yeah, it was talking cool. amongst the, yourselves oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. sharing things? Cool. Yeah, I've got you know friends in New Zealand now. The luthier community is friendly. That's good because you it's, know when you do something in isolation, like you know, I always liked making beats in my basement. You know, I'd be so isolating and and lonely. But then, like going to a festival, you get to meet all the other artists and and typically for the most part, I mean, there's definitely some assholes out there, but for the most part, everybody was like, you know, homies because it, we all live this strange life. We had that in yeah. common. We backpack all over the place by ourselves and, you know, hotels and backstage world. And so there's like some camaraderie there. It's good to hear that there, you know, that that's it, happening. It definitely. Yeah. Super friendly. And that particular event, everyone was a fan of each other. It was really fun. That's cool. I mean, it takes too long to really steal somebody's thing. Like that. I don't know. You're going to see Taylor <laughs> Guitars making my version of the PL1 soon, I'm sure of it, because they came over a couple of times at my booth and I could see them talking about it. And I'm thinking, oh, man. Were you, were you kind of like positioning yourself in between? <laughs> like, hey, guys, how are you? Like, let me just. <laughs> I don't I mean, that's the, I had that thought of, I mean, it's not an original design. It's a. It's a hun it's based off a hundred year old guitar that I absolutely love. However, nobody was is making it right, and so it felt like a way that I could find a niche for my myself because there's so many amazing guitar builders building acoustic guitars, dreadnoughts, or this or that. I wanted to make a living doing this, but how do you do it? I thought, well, I love that guitar. Why not make one and see if that worked? And you're and it makes you know does what you want it to do. And I did. I made a prototype, and I thought this is cool. It's totally worth doing. And I made six after that. And then or it's, and then it's just kind of multiplied and multiplied. And now I've got 25 of them out there. So it's a thing. It's kind of, and it's helped me make a living building guitars. Or it is my living. I mean, it's my bread and butter for sure. I get other orders, but 12 strings for some reason. I keep making 12 strings. Really? Is that, that's a common custom order? It has been, yeah, which is kind of weird. Is that a hard instrument to make because of the tension involved? Less so, it's less tension involved than you'd think. It's more uh, the playability because that is like kind of everyone's complaint is like, ah, oh, this thing sucks. You don't want to play it. Right. right. <laughs> like, 12 strings are kind of like those guitars that you, you kind of want and you get and then you don't always play once you get it because it's such a thing that it's got so many. Yeah. So I was, I think I can make a playable one. Um, and it's, so for whatever reason, I've, I've been getting those orders, but the, the PL1 has been something that's like really like allowed me to do this full time. And, and maybe now with that, I can start doing other things. Like I have an idea or a couple ideas for electric guitars. This will be a mahogany body with a maple top, but chambered. And then it'll have F holes. Um, sometimes a cutaway, sometimes not. Um, Tailpiece um, to P90s, um, two tons and two volumes. Um, basic, just, you know, kind of this pretty simple electric guitar. This is one that I was, I started drawing when I was 19. I think I had just gotten my SG. That's a nice guitar. And obsessed with Garcia's uh, Tiger guitar. What I decided to do with this is have two humbuckers in a single coil and then be able to split the humbuckers, run them parallel, parallel, run them in series, or so you could basically have a strat sound or a humbucker sound or multiples in between there. This is just so customized, right? It's just a hundred percent custom enterprise that you're doing. I tell people I make everything but the metal parts, like the, you know, the tuners. <laughs> Other than that, everything's being fabricated from chunks of wood. Where do you source your wood? I have like four different places I get everything from. There's different species of wood I use for different guitars. So it's, I have a few different places. Like the top woods I'll get, I get from Alaska, particularly our, that um, guitar that I showed you, I took from Nam. That's, that was a tree that had fallen years ago and has just been soaked with water. 
Wow. And then they find it and cut it and kill and dry it. And then uh, it's got all these amazing streaking in it from the from the minerals and that have been leaching in the grains of wood. And so different places have different woods that I'm trying to, I uh, want to use. That's cool. Does it take a lot of research to kind of find that stuff? The internet, internet, basically everything yeah, is available like, and shows up on a UPS? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just like everything else or this whole process, you just start looking it up and, you know, figure it out eventually or keep learning. I mean, you were in a band called Heavyweight Dub Champion, and um, that's actually where we met, as far as I can remember, was at Windover the Earth, yeah. where I was working as a pro audio consultant, and you guys were doing a bunch of recording for Heavyweight Dub Champion and renting tape decks, half-inch two-track. Is that what it was? Yeah, I was trying to remember when that was that we met you. I mean, what we were renting from you was the, the half-inch tape. We did all our mixes onto that but and then what from there we mastered and made the record um how we'd perform is like we'd have a 32 channel board and in that board we'd have first we were using we were using adats like we <laughs> carried around three adats at one point to run 24 cha- tracks of music into the 32 channel board so and just each- massive amount of patching like just to get your stage set up was just like a full studio patch oh yeah and if, is that why they call you Patch? <laughs> that's a funny, <laughs> funny thing. That's my given name. That's what my, my parents named me. And right. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> it just came in handy. <laughs> that I would end up, you know, doing all that. But so each channel of that board, though, would be like a kick drum, a snare drum, a hi-hat, a bass, a guitar, a synth, you know, but sometimes there'd be multiple, like multiple hi-hat patterns and multiple kick drum patterns or the, you know, um, and the performance was live engineering, live mixing the album or the, the music and having all these outboard effects that could go in and take a hi-hat and turn it from a, and add something like a triplet to it. So you start like making movement with the, with the beat or doing with the snare, like, you know, so you start really syncopating the beats, but then it's like, with guitars, you have tape echoes and go, you know, really dub it out. Or So that was the performance of it. And it was live mixing these predetermined tracks or sounds. I mean, they weren't, there was, this wasn't like a press play, full stereo right. mix, there you right. go kind of thing. And that was the performance. And it was, what I loved about it was it was always different. Um, even if you want to do something again. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, as you got better, you could replicate some things, but there was... Uh, always the potential train wreck, which I think when you have that, then you always have potential magic. Also. Right, and you got to stay on your toes, and it keeps you really engaged. And that's what's thing. fun. Yeah. And then also along with that, we had uh, um, synthesizers playing li- like live synthesizers or live sound effects and um, um, saxophone or MCs. Or so there was a live element in it too. I mean, there's sometimes three of us or there's sometimes nine of us up there. I did, when I, after Heavyweight, I did two solo records, which were really kind of, I just kind of needed to do for me. Yeah. And one of them is totally, or one of them, the goal was to be just minimal and ambient and just not layer things like crazy and just, but just try and make it be something totally else. I did a job, I built an office out of some, out of Babinga, yeah, which is this hardwood, gorgeous hardwood for I like use, you know, huge desktops, cabinets, drawers, um, and I saved every single piece that was dropped. I still have lots and bits and pieces of it, but I made a case for the synth, which I've been working on building piece by piece for years. I started this because I wanted a, a Moog Voyager, right? But I couldn't afford it, <laughs> so, which ended up being like twenty times more expensive right in the end, right? Totally. But I was like, at least this way, it's sort of like a payment plan, because like I can build a oscillator, right? And then another one, sequencers. Okay. So th- three sequencers. This is a mixer, filters. This is a chorus, little patch bay, gates, VCAs oscillators and low frequency oscillators lots of them didn't work when i would first wire it up and then you have to figure out how 
So you soldered every joint in this thing? Or yeah. Did you, yeah. You didn't buy any prefab? No. Wow. No. And a lot of ice cream headaches. Greatest tape delay ever, I think. I got that on eBay for 50 bucks because it was broken. And all it needed was WD-40. All my acoustic guitar necks are shaped after this SG neck. Unless somebody asks for something different. Because this is my favorite neck ever. Like, I just needed to do those two projects. I mean, I have, in my head, there's, there's still three others <laughs> I want to do. Right. But I got those out, and I'm happy. Well, brother, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and, definitely. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in, you guys. Peace. house and back it's 9 30 p.m what time to leave 6 30 a.m now to carry this stuff inside and uh, get some sleep <laughs>